Integrated rate laws tell us about the time dependence of reactant concentrations in a reaction, and actually product concentrations as well, if we're willing to apply a little bit of stoichiometry. So they're highly useful for practical problems where we want to know how long is it going to take to use up this lump of reactant, or how long will it take to produce this amount of product that I need, or how much do I have left after some amount of time, questions like this. In this video, we're going to work some practice problems where we're applying the integrated rate laws to solve problems like this. And it's tempting to dive right into the math in these problems, but as I've said in other videos and tried to emphasize throughout this series, it's helpful to take a step back and kind of diagram, what do I know? What's the situation? And what am I trying to find before you dive in and start going right to the equations, right to the formulas, right to trying to solve for something. It'll make the process of problem solving a lot more fun, honestly, and a lot more helpful in general terms than just diving right into the math. So with that prelude out of the way, let's take a look at the problem you see here. We've got a rate constant for the first order decomposition of cyclobutane, which is C4H8, that's given here. And we're asked how long it will take for 80% of a sample of C4H8 to decompose via the chemical equation that's given here. So there's a lot of useful informa information packed into this small package. First of all, first order decomposition. The reaction is first order in cyclobutane. We can write the integrated rate law based on that knowledge. The other thing here that's useful is this 80% of the sample is gone. This means that if we think about the initial concentration of C4H8, let's call it A just to keep things simple, that initial concentration being equal to 1, then we're interested in the time at which the concentration of A is equal to 0.2. This corresponds to 80% of that 1, say, mole per liter, being gone. We also know the value of K is equal to 9.2 times 10 to the negative 3 per second. And notice those units are appropriate for first order kinetics which is also given in the problem. All right, before we dive into the math and even write out the first order integrated rate law, let's think about this situation graphically. So we start at t equals zero with one mole per liter of A, let's say. And we're interested in the point along the x-axis, if you like, the time point where the concentration of A is at point two. And we know that this decay follows first order kinetics. Mathematically, this is exponential decay, if you look at the form of the integrated rate law. Now that we have this graphical understanding of what's going on, let's write that integrated rate law for a first order process. We've got the concentration of A at some time point, T, is equal to the initial concentration of A, E raised to the power of negative K times T. And I've gone ahead here and plugged in the K value that we know into that uh, exponential exponent there. Now, we want to solve for T. How do we do that when t appears in an exponent? Well, we've got to take the natural log of both sides. I've done that here after dividing both sides by a0 so that we have only time terms on the right-hand side and only concentration terms on the left. The other thing I've done is change t to t minus 0 to make this look like the multi-point form of the first order integrated rate law, which we saw in the last video. Now I know a sub t, that's 0.2, and I know a sub 0, that's 1. And so I can simplify this to the natural log of 0.2 is equal to negative k times t, and I can solve for t, and t comes out to 170 seconds. There it is. So this is a nice example of applying the integrated rate law to determine the length of time it will take to decompose a reactant to a certain extent. I actually don't want to spend a ton of time on this second problem, which gives us some kinetic data in the form of H2O2 concentrations over time and asks us to verify that this reaction is first order in H2O2. The thing I want to point out is that the natural log of H2O2 concentration is linearly dependent on time, and we can get a sense of this based on the data, just thinking through things kind of semi-quantitatively, if you like. Notice, for example, that we start with the natural log of H2O2 being equal to zero, one mole per liter of H2O2. After six hours, we're at negative 0.693 for that natural log of H2O2 concentration. If we double the reaction time going from six to 12, we double 
the natural log of H2O2. This is a linear dependence right here. These three points, where the points are the time and the natural log of H2O2 concentration as X and Y, will form a line. There's a linear dependence here. That linear dependence corresponds to first order kinetics. And I encourage you to graph this in Microsoft Excel or your favorite spreadsheet software to verify this. In this problem, we're asked about the dimerization reaction of butadiene, C4H6. Here, dimerization refers to the idea that two molecules of butadiene are combining to form a single product or a dimer. This dimerization reaction is second order, so we're going to be applying the second order integrated rate law. We're given the rate constant, just like the other problem, and we know the initial concentration of butadiene, and we're asked what is the concentration after 10 minutes. So this is kind of a remix of the first problem where we're not interested in the time, we're given the time and we're interested in the concentration at that time point given the initial concentration and the rate constant and the order. Three pieces of information that are key here. So we know, for example, the initial concentration, C4H60, is 0.2 moles per liter. We know the reaction is second order, and so we can write the second order rate law. And here I've used the linearized form 1 over C4H6, where C4H6 to the negative 1 power is the initial concentration to the negative 1 power plus K times T. And here, Note the units of K are per molar, per minute, and so the minute units of time match the minute units in the time we're given. So we can go ahead and plug in everything we know. In fact, we know everything on the right-hand side of that integrated rate law equation. Initial concentration is 0.2 moles per liter. We know the value of K given in the problem, and we know 10 minutes had elapsed. 10 minutes is our time point of interest. And if we calculate all of this out, we get 5.58 inverse moles per liter, or inverse molar is equal to 1 over C4H6. So to get the final molarity of C4H6 at this 10 minute time point, we have to do 1 over 5.58, and this comes out to a concentration of C4H6 equal to 0 0.179 moles per liter. So Operationally, this is very similar to the first problem. It's just that the knowns and unknowns have changed. Here we know the time, we know the initial concentration, we know the rate constant, and we're interested in the final concentration at the time point of interest. As with the second problem, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this one because it's going to require you to do some graphing in Excel. We have the data for the reaction in the previous problem, the dimerization of butadiene, and this problem asks us to verify that this reaction is in fact second order in butadiene by transforming the data that's given here. And if you do that, and you look at a plot, for example, of the natural log of C4H6 concentration versus time, this will appear nonlinear. However, if you look at a plot of one over the concentration of C4H6 versus time, this will appear linear, and this allows us to conclude that the reaction is second order in C4H6. The graph you get will look something like this, and it will fit the equation in blue. A concentration raised to the negative one power is the initial A concentration to the negative one power plus KT. To find the rate constant, which is kind of the second half of this problem, we can look at the slope of this line, and we could look at the slope of the line of best fit, or we could look at the slope of the line between two, for example, adjacent time points. And if we do the latter, we can, for example, subtract 1 over A concentration for two adjacent time points, and then in the denominator, subtract the times, for example, 6,200 seconds and, and 0 seconds. And if you do this using the first and last time points, as I've done here, you get 0 0.0614 per molar per second as the rate constant. You can also just use the line of best fit as generated by your spreadsheet software, and that's arguably a more robust approach since it uses all five time points. It uses all five trials, all five experimental measurements to pop out a value for K. Finally, in this problem, we're asked about the zero order rate constant for the decomposition of ammonia on a tungsten surface. And we can see pretty clearly from this graph that if we focus on the decomposition on tungsten, which is the upper line, this looks linear. Uh, on the graph, and it's a graph of the ammonia concentration as a function of time. So this data looks zero order, as it kind of darn well should. 
So we can model this line mathematically as the concentration of NH3 at some future time point is the initial concentration minus KT. And if we're interested in K, well, what we're interested in is the slope of this line. And to make it easiest to deal with on your computer or phone screen and uh, kind of give us the widest range, um, which is arguably the best estimate, I'm going to look at the first and last points along this uh, line for the decomposition on tungsten. So that's the upper line here again, as we said earlier. And if I look at the first and last points, and I focus on the y value first, it goes from about 2.8 times 10 to the negative third moles per liter down to about 1.5 times 10 to the negative third moles per liter at that last time point. And if I look at the x-axis now, the span from left to right is about 1,000 seconds from the first to the last time point. So to estimate the slope, I simply apply rise over run, right? Doing a little uh, subtraction and division there. And this pops out to a rate constant of 1.3 times 10 to the negative sixth moles per liter per second. And notice that the units make sense. We would expect the units of the rate constant to be moles per liter per second for a zero order process. And rise over run here corresponds to moles per liter over seconds, exactly the units of the rate constant we would expect for a zero order process.